Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about when I've been let down by my favorite authors. So I have a stack of books right here, of books that are written by some of my all-time favorite authors that let me down. And I wanted to talk about that because it's been happening to me a lot lately and it got me thinking about that just in general, about honestly how much harder it is to read a book that, um, not just that, because if a book is hyped and you expect a lot from it, then it's sad when it lets you down. But if it's a book by an author that you love, therefore it's not just, you know, notoriety or hype or the word of mouth that makes you think it's going to be good. It's your own experience that leads you to believe that it's good. And it also means that you know that this author is capable of better. It's not that you've read this thing by them and you're like, oh, just kidding, that wasn't so good. They're not such a great author. You know they're a good author, so you know they can do better, which makes it honestly for me that much harder to read something because it feels like there's why? Like, there's no excuse for this. I know you've done better. I've seen it. I've loved it. This is why I love your work. And how did you mess up? <laughs> why did you mess up? So unfortunately, I do have a stack here of one, two, three, six books that are by all-time favorite authors of mine that they're not like necessarily one star reads. I think, yeah, one of them is, <laughs> um, but they all let me down. And I'm sad. And we're going to talk about how they let me down and why I think that happened. Because I have theories. <laughs> okay, I sort of organize the stack by size. So that's also the order in which that I'm going to uh, talk about these because that's the easiest way to do it, in my opinion. So on top, because it's the tiniest, <laughs> is Stardust by Neil Gaiman. Um, I don't actually talk about him that often on my channel, um, probably just because I've already read all of his work. So it's not like what I'm currently reading. And he hasn't really had anything new come out since Norse mythology, so I haven't had a new book to anticipate or discuss. So Neil Gaiman is one of my all-time favorite authors, if not my all-time favorite author. I th sometimes I say that and then I struggle with that because there's other authors I love as well, but he's he's up there. I adore Neil Gaiman. Stardust, I did not adore. So when I tell people that Neil Gaiman is great and have they read anything by Neil Gaiman, I have unfortunately often heard from people, they're like, um, I read Stardust and I didn't like it. And I'm like, me neither. <laughs> you should still read Neil Gaiman because I don't feel like it is uh, an, a good example of his, his writing, his style, or his work. Um, and a lot of people who love Gaiman love Stardust, so I'm not saying that it's impossible that everyone universally agrees that this isn't what, you know, his best work. Some people love it. I don't. And I don't think even people who do like it and like Gaiman in general, I don't think that they would disagree um, with me saying that it is very different from his other work. It's not, even if you like it, it's not a good example of what his style is like in general. So what I love about Neil Gaiman generally is his ability to take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. To take like mundane objects and imbue them with mystery and meaning and significance and magic. So it does stand to reason that his attempt to write something that is entirely a fairy tale where everything is magical isn't really his forte, which is what happened with Stardust. Stardust is basically a fairy tale as told by Neil Gaiman. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of magic in it and there's there's a lot of whimsical, interesting things going on that it feels really cold and it feels really empty to me. So while he can take, you know, a New York subway and turn it into the most magical thing I have ever read, um, a story that's entirely built on magic just suddenly lost all of its heart, all of its significance, all of its meaning. So I don't exactly know how that happened or why that happened, but I think there is something to that. The fact that his, the magic in his writing is often him delving beneath the surface of something and this glimpse into something larger and greater and more magical than meets the eye. But when everything meeting the eye is magic, it's not magical anymore. I don't know how else to say it. It's sort of uh, the magical equivalent of the way that Hitchcock viewed suspense, that anything that he shows you is not going to be nearly as terrifying as whatever he's not showing you. And that's sort of true of Neil Gaiman's writing, the fact that he's given you enough pieces to make you wonder and make you feel like everything around you is more than it seems. But Stardust is all of the more than it seems part without that surface level hiding it. You are now on the magic side of things. Everything is magic now. So there's no mystery. <laughs> it's not interesting anymore. And I didn't really connect with the characters. It was, it was fine. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't magical. For a book that's entirely about magic, it wasn't at all magical to me, <laughs> which is a weird thing to say, but I think that's why. And that's why it let me down. Next up, I have one that I have actually a lot of feelings about. So 
this might be like the longest section of this video. Um, and that is Phoenix Unbound by Grace Draven. This book is her first traditionally published book as far as I know. That's my understanding of the situation with this. So I don't know how much that may or may not have played into why this failed. I don't think that it has anything to do with what I didn't like. Um, it's possible that that had some effect, maybe a, a line editor or something um, that she didn't work with before. I, I don't think so though. I doubt it. So if you've never heard of Grace Draven, I am a huge fan of her book Radiance, uh, but I've also enjoyed pretty much everything of hers that I've read. Um, I didn't love Master of Crows. That's my least favorite, but it was fine. Better than this. And Entreat Me, which is her Beauty and the Beast retelling, is also very good and I enjoyed it a lot. Radiance, I have read like four times in the last year. It's not a very long book. I think it's around 300 pages, maybe less. So it's not like I've reread a tome, but I really, really love it. And all that to say, like, I, I adore that book specifically, but her writing in general hasn't really let me down. That's my favorite, which is why I read it the most. But I've enjoyed her writing and I fully expected to once again enjoy this. And I was shocked <laughs> by how lacking this was. So the reason that I love Grace Draven's writing um, she writes romantic fantasy or fantasy romance, or I don't know exactly what order you're supposed to say that, um, which is not really something that I read very often, because in my experience, it's not like Grace Draven. I really, if every fantasy romance, romance fantasy um, author wrote like Grace Draven, I'd read the shit out of that. <laughs> but I think she writes characters really beautifully, really believably. The relationships that she writes about, they feel very human and they feel they don't feel contrived, which is one of the things that I dislike or is, is perhaps a misconception or an assumption that I've made wrongly. But that's sort of how I, my experience with romantic fantasy outside of her has been that everything feels extremely contrived, petty, filled with unnecessary drama, a lot of stuff that I'm just like, I don't, I don't like this. I don't like these characters. I think they're being stupid and selfish or the situation is so painfully unbelievable or so insta-lovey or insta-lust. And I just, I don't like it. Grace Draven writes in a way that I feel like I really know these people. Their relationship, their faith in each other, their love for each other is believable. The She paints a world fairly simply relative to other fantasy that I read because I like to read, you know, epic high and grimdark fantasy. But she does world building in a very, she does it really well. She gives you just enough of the world to make you feel like you are in another world. So she does it well. So when I read it, it's an immersive experience where I like the characters, I like the world, I believe everything that I'm reading, I'm into it, I like it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's good, it's well done, it's well constructed. This, Phoenix Unbound, from the outset, the premise of it, I, I was told this was like her grittiest and darkest and most complex and emotionally layered and hardest to read kind of thing. So I was like, okay, this is gonna be dark. The premise would certainly make me think that it should be. And it wasn't as dark as it needed to be. So I don't, either she should have had a different premise if she wasn't willing to delve or she should have delved. So in the outset of this book, we have two characters. If this is a hate to love story, which is already not my favorite, but I was like, Grace Draven does write well. And I'm sure if anyone can write hate to love in a way that I'll buy it or love it, it'll be Grace Draven. And honestly, it wasn't the hate to love aspect of it that I disliked. That part of it was, well, it was just as, uh, as everything else up that went. She wrote about two people who have extremely tortured backgrounds, extremely tortured pasts. The main character, the, the girl, um, she is imbued with this sort of magic that enables her to, there's a sort of like, it's like gladiator meets the Dothraki is the sort of worlds colliding in this book. And there is these gladi gladiatorial sort of fights and sac uh, female sacrifices in the capital. And the city is supposed to give, you know, a, I don't know if she has to be a virgin, but give a young woman to be sacrificed for this thing once a year. But our main character, our main female character, her magic enables her to step into the pyre and come away unburned. And she can like change her appearance with magic. So she can go over and over again every single year and be their sacrifice. Um, so that no one actually has to die because it doesn't kill her. It's rough to do that because like women who are about to be sacrificed usually get used as sex objects and being burned alive, it does hurt her even though she doesn't die. So it's a really rough thing for her, for her to have to do every single year. And so uh, our main male character is a guy who's like an enslaved gladiator type dude. 
and he's been that for like 10 years or something. Um, but he can see through her glamour and realizes that that's what she's doing, that she's the same person coming year after year. And as a gladiator, he's been raped and abused physically and emotionally for like full on 10 years. And we get to see that as well in the beginning, him being raped and sexually abused. And he basically makes a deal with her to uh, escape and then basically kidnaps her because he needs her for uh, when he goes back to his people, which are sort of the Dothraki style people um, to convince them to take him back and like blah, 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 blah. So she hates him for kidnapping her after that. And then she gets to know him on the road and whatever. And they fall in love as you'd expect. I don't think that's a huge spoiler. That's the setup. And that setup is fine. Like that's an interesting setup. And there's so much emotional depth to those situations. So much to explore and to grapple with. But neither of these characters acts in a way that it's believable that they are scarred and triggered. So either don't give these characters these dark backstories because you're not willing to go there or you need to go there. You need to show them wrestling with these inner demons, which they don't. They snipe at each other and hate each other, but that's for the hate to love part, the hate part of the hate to love. And then when they start, uh, when they're into the love part of stuff, there's no issues whatsoever with physical intimacy. It's fine. They're into each other, it's insta-lovey, and it's fine. I'm sorry. If you're going to write about a character, a male character that's been raped and abused, if this had been written the other way around, where a female had been raped and abused her whole, not her whole life, but for years and years, and she suddenly had no issues with physical intimacy, I feel like readers would revolt. It, the same is true for men. I can't buy that this male character, who I was told by the narrative and also shown by the narrative, was being raped and abused a lot for years. He has no problems with physical intimacy. None. This isn't triggering for him. It's not weird for him. It's not an issue at all. Not even a little bit. I, what was the point of that dark backstory then if we're not actually going to explore that? If it's not going to be something that they have to deal with? And I was shocked because Grace Draven's writing in general, what I've loved about her writing in the past is how much the, the characters feel fully fleshed out. Whatever their backstories are does come and become involved in what they're dealing with, how they react to things. It, it plays a part in the foundation of their relationship. In fact, some of their dark backstories. She's written less dark backstories and had the characters grapple with it more in her other books. Here, these are really dark backstories and the characters are like fine with it. They, they play lip service to the fact that they are tortured and abused, but it doesn't affect them in any real way. And for that reason, I found it lacking in depth and poorly done and kind of offensive. It's it's like their tortured backstories are a token at that point. If you're not actually going to write about a tortured couple with torture issues, then then why give them those backstories? Just don't. You could have had a hate to love where he's just a gladiator and that's all he's been, where he's been fighting a while because that's rough. But if you're going to give him the backstory of the rape and abuse, you need to actually explore it. Otherwise, don't do it. Okay, next up is one that didn't let me down nearly as much as that, so calm down. <laughs> the next one I have is The Heroes by Joe Abercrombie. This is one of the books in the first law world, which I adore, as you know. However, this book didn't have a plot. <laughs> there was so much about it that was the characteristic quintessential Joe Abercrombie. So there was things about it that I really, really loved, like individual moments of brilliance and jokes that were fantastically written and like some excellent character development that he did within this story. So he did a good job, but like the, the craft of it was still excellent, but there was no plot. I don't know what the point of this book was, except it's pointlessness. <laughs> this book is about a battle, which um, even though these, I guess, are meant to be standalones outside of the First Law Trilogy, I don't think you'd really at all understand what's going on here if you hadn't read the First Law Trilogy. You'd have no context for this. Having read the First Law Trilogy, I knew who the players were and kind of the larger context of why this battle is happening. But this is just like multiple days of battle and it's like the parts of the book are divided that way. It's like day one, day two. Um, and you get multiple perspectives for different sides of the battle. So you're not just following one side of it. You're not rooting for either side. You're familiar with the sides from the First Law Trilogy. Otherwise, again, I think you really wouldn't give a shit. And that's it. That's the whole book. It's that battle and all the battle decisions that are being made or not being made, good decisions, bad decisions, political backstabbing going on and battling, and then it's over. It's literally, that's the whole book. Like if this was the middle book of a trilogy, I would be like, that's a bit much to devote to one battle. But at least, I, I mean, I guess that establishes the middle bit where like 
the part before was all the politics and the part after is resolution and this was the battle part. But this is just sort of by itself. This isn't the middle book of a trilogy. It's just a book about a, a battle, multiple days of battle. So he writes the action very well. He writes the reactions of people in battle and how people who've never been in battle before, how they're reacting to it. People who have been in battle for years and years, how they're reacting to it the carnage, the emotions of it, the politicking. He does it all really, really well, as he always does. And the banter, the snark, it's fantastic. It's great. I just don't get the point of this book. And even the, Joe Abercrombie has a tendency to do that, where like sometimes the point of something is that it's pointlessness, that sometimes life doesn't have a meaning. But there's usually a story, <laughs> something happening. So yeah, I just, I don't get it. I don't get why this was written. If this was shorter and part of a trilogy, or if there was more to it than just the battle, something. But it's it's literally that. It's like if somebody wrote about the Battle of Helm's Deep, but didn't write the rest of the Lord of the Rings, it's like just the Battle of Helm's Deep. And you'd be like, why? I really like the Battle of Helm's Deep, but it's because there's context <laughs> and it's leading to a thing. <laughs> it's not just the battle. I, I just don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. it. The back of it just says, three men, one battle, no heroes. Yeah, that's the whole book. You don't have to read it. That's what happens in it. A battle. Lots of people die. That's it. I, I don't get it. The next book is City of Ghosts by V.E. Schwab or Victoria Schwab because she writes as Victoria when it's for kids. This is a middle grade book and this is an arc that I received at Y'all West two years ago. A year, well, the previous Y'all West, not Y'all West this year. And I expected because it's Schwab for it to be the way that sort of Neil Gaiman writes middle grade, because I don't really read middle grade very much, but I do like middle grade by Neil Gaiman because he writes for children as though they were adults with just a smaller vocabulary. <laughs> it's still just as dark and complex. It's just told in a way that is accessible for children. So Schwab writes kind of in a dark way and she's friends with Neil Gaiman. So I had high hopes for this, that this would be sort of Gaiman-esque, that it's, yes, it's for kids, but it's gonna be dark and interesting and kind of creepy. This is just boring. It was really boring. It felt like, a Saturday morning show that I might have watched when I was a kid and it wouldn't have been my favorite, but it comes on after my favorite, so I watch it too. This follows a girl who can see ghosts and discovers that she should probably be trying to help those ghosts to sort of transition to the afterlife. And like, there's a lot of her running around Scotland because her parents are like, they, their job is like a ghost hunting TV show. And so while they're filming, she's actually seeing ghosts. They don't know she can. So there's some fun antics and the ghost thing is kind of, I guess, kind of interesting. It just didn't really feel like it had a soul or substance. There's just sort of some adventures, some antics, some funny moments, but it, it just didn't, it just wasn't anything there. And I wanted to like it. I was just really, really bored and I wasn't bored. It wasn't necessarily that it was childish. It just, it just like was nothing to it. So it was, it was fine, but I was really, for a book about a girl in Scotland with ghosts, it was incredibly boring. Next up, I have a book that y'all already know how I feel about, so this is gonna be quick. Or you can go watch the video where I talk about it at length. Aurora Rising. I still cannot believe that they wrote this book. I'm not gonna go too in depth because I talked about this book for like 40 minutes in my review of it, so go watch that if you're interested. Yeah. I have read their other work and loved it. I have read their other sci-fi work and loved it. This book was garbage. There was nothing I liked about this book, literally nothing. And I hated it even more for the fact that it's written by authors that I love and I know they can do better. If this had been written by anyone else, I'd have been like, yikes to that, never reading anything by them again. I am going to continue reading their work. Well, not the sequel to this, but they're good authors. So I know they can do better than this. And I was stunned, appalled, and mildly offended by this whole book. Um, there is something that I didn't talk about in my long review that I guess I can bring up now. One of the characters in this book um, we are told is a sociopath and she is one of the POV characters and she's one of our heroes. And the treatment of her in this book is offensive because this is the future. This is set in the future. And this treatment of sort of uh, cognitive diversity of um, mental, like, I don't know what the word for it is. And I probably come, I'm sounding really ignorant right now, but like, just because somebody's like on the spectrum, you know, that they may or may not be autistic or something like that. The fact that she's written off as being a sociopath and that's pretty much what the characters say about her and that's how she's treated in her POV chapters are like one sentence. I mean, I, that's, I didn't think we did that anymore. I thought we had moved beyond just labeling people and putting them in boxes and, and being so offensive. Like, 
I just, I'm just, I'm shocked. There's just one more thing I hate about it. If you want to see everything else I hate about it, go watch that full review. But, uh, uh, and last but not least is King of Scars by Lee Bardugo. I didn't hate this, but I didn't love it. And the more I've thought about it since reading it, the more I feel like it was a mistake to return to sort of the Grisha trilogy part of the Grishaverse. It felt like retrogress. And it felt like when Disney decided to give Jack Sparrow his own trilogy, you're like, nah, <laughs> nah. Because the Nikolai Lansov duology is that. Nikolai Lansov worked as a side character. He was a great side character, an interesting side character, and you left the audience wanting more. Going back and giving him his own duology feels like Jack Sparrow being the main character, and you're like, just kidding, this does not work. Because part of what made him special was the fact that you had him sparingly, and he was sort of enigmatic. But for a book about Nikolai, he was not actually in it that much. And seeing, you know, behind the curtain of his internal monologue and his feelings about things... It wasn't exciting or interesting. It just kind of removed the mystique. The book wasn't really about him. It was about Zoya and Nina. And it just felt like returning to a world that like there was nothing more to tell. And we were just going back there for fan service. I feel like there's so much more to the Grisha verse that Lee Bardugo could write about. If she she moved on from the Grisha trilogy and went on to Ketterdam, wrote Six of Crows and wrote about this whole new cast of characters in a new part of her world. So I would like to have seen her continue to do that. We can move now to Shu Han. We can move now to Novia Zem. There's other parts of her world that we can explore. And Nikolai can show up again. Other characters can have cameos. If she wanted to release maybe a novella about Nikolai, that'd be fine. Because people love Nikolai. So if you wanted to do a little bit of that, sure, I'm on board with that. But this felt like just going back for fan service... For no reason. I didn't feel like there was a story here to tell. There wasn't. And like forcing there to be one is what it felt like. And she did a lot of things really well. There was parts of this book that were five star classic Bardugo. Good job. I cried a little bit in it. Like it was a lot of it was well written, but I just I didn't feel like this book needed to be written. I don't feel like it needed to happen. And I feel like it kind of takes away from some of the magic of Nikolai. I just assumed Nikolai had been left alone. <laughs> he can remain the enigmatic privateer prince. This didn't help his story. So yeah, those are some of the books written by some of my favorite authors that let me down. Let me know in the comments down below if your favorite authors have ever let you down, when and how they did it, how you felt about it, how you felt about the books that I just listed if you have read them. Let me know all the things. I post videos on Saturdays, so like and subscribe, and I'll see you next Saturday. Bye.